Good evening. How are you guys? Thank you for being with us, really appreciate it. I'm Jim Sturgis, Executive Director of Pioneer Institute, and we are deeply appreciative of the ongoing partnership we have with the Harvard Medical School, and we'd like to thank the Harvard uh, Me Medical School staff and the Pioneer team for setting up a really great event for you this evening. A round of applause, please. So we're especially grateful, of course, to Secretary Azar for being with us. It's an honor to host the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, and it is encouraging to know that an individual of remarkable preparation and experience holds this important office at a time that's extremely important in U.S. healthcare policy. I think one of the questions that was asked to me before is, hey, where do we go from here? He'll give you the answer to that. Uh, tonight, for the 13th time, uh, we honor our longtime chairman, uh, Colby Hewitt, Jr. Uh, he was chairman of Pioneer Institute for eight years and was also chairman of the Beth Israel Deaconess. We honor him with a lecture that brings together two things that he loved. One is Pioneer Institute and the other is Boston as a medical innovator. To Chuck and to Teak, to Colby, Jennifer, Josie, and John, and to Dick, thank you very much for being with us this evening. We really appreciate it. We're grateful for your, the, the role that your family has played in our own history in developing Pioneer into a greater and greater influence in the area of healthcare. Uh, we are especially uh, thankful to our sponsors. Our Hewitt, Platinum, and corporate sponsors include Kathy and Brackett Denniston, Seal and Bill Hicks, Andrew and Florence, uh, Andrew Davis and uh, Florence Bourgeois, sorry guys. Um, Fred and Barbara Clifford, the Hewitt family, Holt and Sandra Massey, Peter and Sally Wild, Advantage and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our partners for this event this evening include Steve and Betsy Fantone, Ellen and Bruce Hertzfelder, Al and Pat Houston, Gary and Susan Kearney, Pamela and Jake Layton, Adam Portnoy, Mark and Lynn Rickabaugh, Amgen, Sapphire Digital, the Retailers Association of Massachusetts, and Tufts Health Plan. Please, a round of applause for them as well. So a couple of uh, noteworthy attendees this evening. We're all special, but they're special special. <laughs> So Mary Lou Sutters, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of Massachusetts. Mary Lou, where are you? <laughs> the CEO of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, Travis McCready. Travis, thanks for you being here. And Health Policy Commissioner, Executive Director David Seltz. Uh, if you are on Twitter, please reference the hashtags that are up here at the bottom of the screen as you uh, tweet, and tweet to your heart's delight. Um, so, a couple of opening remarks, very brief. Uh, over the last decade and a half, this lecture has covered a lot of territory, everything from Romney care to Obamacare to Massachusetts 12, 2012 reform, price and cost transparency, Medicaid reforms, the opioid crisis, pharmaceutical pricing, and more, it's been a period of astonishing disruption. And I don't mean just in terms of new technology, new innovations on the floor, but I also mean the herky-jerky trajectory of public policy, which is not always helpful. With so much flux and so many opportunities to improve on our current state of affairs, I'm deeply grateful to the US Secretary of Health and Human Services for the fireside chat format. This is a format that will allow us to cover a lot of ground. Um, so it's an opportunity not to hear a prepared speech. It's an opportunity to hear people answer questions. At the end of our 50-minute fireside chat, the secretary has agreed to take questions from the audience. Many of you have left questions on index cards. We have several of them and we'll try to get to them. I hope this evening you've had a chance to interact with our terrific staff. Uh, we have three senior fellows and they cover three priorities. Barbara Anthony focuses on price transparency, Bill Smith on life sciences innovation and pricing solutions, 
and Josh Archambault on market-based reforms, especially as relates to public programs. Josh, who's over here, will do the honors tonight and will be guiding our conversation with the secretary. Pioneer's healthcare work benefits from a strong advisory board and also from great board leadership. And It is my pleasure to invite Pamela Layton, who will be introducing Secretary Azar to the stage. Brief introduction of Pamela. Pamela was most recently president and executive chairman of BioArray Genetics and previously founder and CEO of Parcel Laboratories. She brings a business focus to medical technology and has been a serial entrepreneur developing stem cell therapies and molecular di diagnostics. As a pioneer board director, she has been an energetic participant on all fronts, including advice, network building, and also things like penning articles on policy issues, including the value of solid reimbursement policies in the diagnostic field. Pamela, please come to the podium. I'm a little shorter than Jim, so to make some adjustments here. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Pioneer Institute, I am delighted to welcome you to the 2019 Hewitt Healthcare Lecture here at Harvard Medical School. As Jim said, I'm Pam Layton, and uh, in addition to all the other things I do in my life, I've also been on the board of Pioneer for a number of very, very gratifying years. Approximately a year ago, Pioneer started its Life Science Initiative with a purpose of focusing on policies and their changes that are impacting healthcare in the US. As you know, we're extremely active in this space, contributing to improvements in price transparency, creative reimbursement solutions, facing down the opioid crisis, and the list goes on from there. The greater Boston area is arguably one of the most important centers of healthcare expertise and knowledge in the world. We're home to the greatest cluster of life science companies, some of the finest hospitals, many of you have been patients there, top physicians and specialists, a number of the nation's most innovative health plans, and the world's leading medical schools. It's therefore fitting that today we welcome one of our nation's premier healthcare policy experts, Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services, Alex M. Azar II. Alex was sworn in as president of Donald Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services in January of 2018. His current tenure at HHS is his second tour of duty at the department after serving as general counsel and then deputy secretary in the 2000s. He has spent his career working in senior healthcare leadership roles in both public and private sectors. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you the 24th Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Mr. Secretary, for being okay? here. <clears throat> Well, I didn't share this with the secretary, but I spent this past weekend uh, binge watching Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, and Barbara <laughs> Walters to be prepared. Okay. No. <laughs> so we've got a lot of ground we want to cover uh, today, but I thought it might be helpful for us to start at a high level. So the president a couple weeks ago said he wants the Republican Party to be the party of health care. Can you talk to us a little bit about where do you go on that? How does that become a reality from a principles and priority standpoint? Sure. Um, I would say why, why should, and I'm not going to speak about parties, um, uh, but why should those of us who have a more free market, competitive, patient-centric view not own the health care issue? Uh, I've obviously devoted my entire career to that perspective, so I'd be rather, rather foolish to think one should run from that. Uh, 
I believe that we can articulate, and ha we have articulated, we'll continue to articulate, uh, a view of healthcare that is personalized, affordable, patient-centric, that puts you in control of your health care, that treats you as a human being and not like a number. I think we can deliver health care that is affordable. I think it keeps you in control. And I think it is quality. And I think markets can work. Unfortunately, in health care, we haven't often let markets work. There are actually very few parts of health care that function by anybody's definition of a market. Uh, and so I believe that there's tremendous room for, for, for us to, to own this issue and to convince people there's a better way. There's better care than a government takeover of health care. The solution to a partial takeover of health care and its failings is not a complete government takeover over of health care. We're going to get to that tonight for sure because it's certainly in the headlines a lot. But I'm going to step back. Is, is there a personal experience for you that shapes how you think about health care? Well, I'm, I'm the child of health care providers. My father's an ophthalmologist, uh, also taught as an adjunct professor at Wilmer Eye Institute at Hopkins, but a rural doctor. My mother's a surgical nurse, RN, retinal photographer, the whole, the whole shebang. Um, so grew up in, in that culture, although I, as the black sheep of the family, I went to law school, and uh, uh, so I'm not a, not a clinician. But I'd say I actually have one, I've got many, obviously, interactions with healthcare, but I had, I had one that really has stood out and impacts a lot of how I think about my approach to, to healthcare and the change that I want to try to deliver for the American people. Um, I was seeing my doctor um, and wanted to get off medicine. I you know, happened to work at a company that made medicines, but I actually, you know, why take a medicine if you don't need to? I wanted to go off of medicine. He said, you know what, Let's, uh, everything looks good, but I'd like you to get an echocardio stress test just to get a good baseline, make sure everything's good. Okay, so uh, he happens to have his office connected to a major academic medical center. It's actually on the same physical facility as that. I figured I'd be walking to, or he said, do you have time? I said, yeah, yeah I got time, we'll, we'll do it. So I figured I'd be going to the room next door and because I had had this stuff before and get plugged in and we'd get off to the races. Instead, I find myself getting walked through many hallways, down many corridors, and eventually I'm sitting in front of a woman who's banging away at a keyboard, asking me my name, my social security number, my date of birth, all of my medical history, all of my drugs that I'm taking, blah, 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 my insurance information. And she prints off a plastic wristband and slaps it around me. I'm like, whoa, what's that about? And then I get escorted, and before I know it, I find myself in the cardiac care lab of this hospital, you know, where people are having heart attacks. And the good news is I had already been the deputy secretary of HHS, and so I didn't just fall off the turnip truck. And I'm thinking, and, I'm, and my employer a very gener had a very generous health plan, but I had a high deductible HSA. So I'm, spend I'm paying for this myself. And so I go up and I go to the counter at the cardiac lab and I say, well, I see that I appear to be in a hospital. I see that I appear to have been admitted to the hospital. How much is this echocardio stress test going to cost me? We can't tell you. I said, oh, yes, you are going to tell me. How much is this going to cost? And I kept banging away, banging away, and eventually a manager comes out and sits with me and says, well, we can't really tell you how much the test will cost. I said, listen, you're going to tell me, OK? One way or the other, you're going to tell me. So eventually he confesses. Well, our charge master is $5,500. Well, actually, I went to the website of a great Massachusetts institution. Harvard Pilgrim had a really nice uh, website. I don't know if it still exists, but at the time it would tell you sort of what procedures cost, what they ought to cost. And it actually resonated with past experience. It said 550 bucks is what it said you know, if you were doing an office-based. So I said, well, that seems awfully steep. So I've got this insurance company. What's the negotiated discount? Oh, we can't tell you that. That's proprietary information. I said, yeah, but I'm going to pay it. And like after I pay it, I'm going to get an EOB, an explanation of benefits, that's going to tell me what the negotiated rate is. So it's not like a state secret, friend. So tell me the daggone number. So you can imagine this went back and forth for a little while. And eventually he confessed. 
that my insurance company had done the amazingly good negotiating job of driving them down to $3,500. <laughs> and he said, and we'll do that or we'll give you a cash discount of $3,500. Um, needless to say, I, that I, I had a little bit of a tussle where he said, well, you know, we have uncompensated care, we got Medicaid patients, we got the hospital, had, you know, we, hospital has expenses. So that's not my problem. I didn't ask to be in a hospital, I was just at my doctor's office. Tore the wristband off and left. You know, I, I, I made a relatively good amount of money. I could have afforded it, but that whole experience, it was a searing experience for me. And I sort of knew at the time that it was in a way life-changing or frame-altering for me to go through that because here you have the deputy secretary, former Deputy Secretary of Health for the United States who ran Medicare and Medicaid who is having that level of difficulty interacting with our healthcare system to get basic information that I believe is an absolute right of the individual that you should know what a, some, a service should cost before you order the service and commit to paying for it. I firmly believe that, whether that is a drug, a device, a hospital, or a physician procedure. And that just seared in my mind and became something of a rallying cry for me sure. ever since. And you're seeing that in what we're up to. The president fully, he shares this view. So this leads nicely into my next question. In, in presidential debates, they typically ask them to hand, raise their hands to impossibly hard questions. So here's my version. Who's most to blame for this dysfunction? And I can give you multiple well, choice if you want. <laughs> listen, but, I don't, I mean, I've, I've actually given some talks about this back, I haven't, as secretary, but as deputy secretary back in the 2000s, I talked a bit about this. It's not so much blame as you end up there through what seemed to be natural choices at the time, but the simple fact is we have a third party payer system in the United States where one party pays for services, another party chooses to consume them that leads to a complete disconnect and lack of anything resembling market forces and pricing mechanisms. I mean, it doesn't take an a PhD in economics, there, microeconomics, yeah. to figure out what happens. I mean, look at student loan programs, like anything where you have a subsidized or a program that detaches a pricing mechanism from a paying mechanism, and you get this. You get inflated list prices, you get backdoor rebates and discounts, you get negotiated, negotiated discounts, not transparent to the actual purchaser. And it all sort of, in the era before consumer-directed care and cost-sharing and high deductibles, it sort of worked, okay? From the 1930s until really the mid-2000s, it sort of worked because really it was a wealth transfer between really powerful institutions, whether it's hospitals and drug companies or hospitals and insurance companies, just passing money back and forth and the patient sort of sitting off to the sidelines paying their set copay. But once you started getting cost sharing and big deductibles, it's a different game. It's a very different game. And the system has to now change to meet the needs of people like so many of the 40% of you in this room who have a high deductible plan or the 100% of any seniors in this room who have drugs that, are, that have at least a drug that is paid based off of list price through cost sharing or in the donut hole or in the deductible period. Yeah. Let me ask you kind of the flip side of that. So for those that follow, and sorry for all the political framing here, but previous presidential races, the most amount of money was spent against John McCain when he suggested changing the tax structure that, that has kind of really led to that third party payer system in, in that campaign. So unlikely to change anytime soon. So who are you most optimistic who could actually play a leading role in, in moving forward? Is it employers? Is it patients who have to take responsibility? Is it government, you know, insurers? Who, who do you, of those, and you don't have to rank them all, but are there one or two of those players that you're most optimistic that could actually right the ship a little bit? So let, let me start with a couple of propositions. One of them is that um, we need to ensure that we protect individuals who are on Medicare, okay? We have 60 million people on Medicare. We have a sacred trust with them to ensure the promise of Medicare is kept and kept for them and for their benefit. That doesn't mean we can't always make it better, improve quality for them, pay in different and better ways as we'll talk, I'm sure, about to drive value in that system, but we have to protect that system. The employer system. The 100, almost 180 million people who have private sector employer insurance are pretty happy with it. You know, even the folks who say our healthcare system doesn't work, 
if you're in that group, you usually say, but it, work, it works for me, but health care is, you know, broken and not working, but I pretty much like the gig that I've got. I think it's very important um, to not, to, to attempt not to disrupt in that space and to respect that, that it's not our job to change. If people are satisfied with what's working for them, uh, it's not our job to try to be disruptive of that. Um, and there can be, it's great, I think, Tank, to consider root causes, to consider where things might ultimately go. And, but if you actually, to achieve, I think, some incremental important changes, it's very important to respect especially those two areas, which is 240 million Americans who actually are relatively happy with what they've got and don't want that either taken away or disrupted and to really try to respect and value that. Um, but that doesn't mean that within our system we can't do some very important things like um, introducing more transparency, okay? Real transparency, negotiated rate transparency, whether it's rebates or thinking about the rest of our healthcare system. Creating portable, personally owned, interoperable health IT so that your information carries with you wherever you go. That we can't fix our payment systems to drive to site neutrality so that we stop, uh, that we stop basically the payment system incentive towards greater market concentration ag ag and aggregation. Um, all of these things are things that we can do, that we can lay as foundational elements underneath the system, and those will help the employer system, those will help Medicare, they certainly will help those individuals in the individual market who are uninsured, who we'd like to see get the health care that they need, um, and will eventually drive towards more competitive, more market-based systems. But I, I don't think one should be messing around with people's Medicare or their, or their employer-sponsored health insurance. So let's talk a little, for a moment about transparency. Um, here in Massachusetts, we've had a state law since 2012 where you can actually, a patient can get a negotiated rate or an allowed amount. And Pioneer's done a lot of work in this space to try to understand who's using it and who's not using it. In 2007, you gave a talk at the Heritage Foundation where you gave pretty much like you just did, a full-throated endorsement of full price transparency. And you certainly, like you said, some of the activities that you all have been active on recently point in that direction. Can you tell us what, what is the eventual goal here? I'd what, say what? more, well, listen, I'd, I'd say more than point. Now, I gave that talk in 2007 and I shortly left the government, so I lost my ability to impact things. Um, I'm back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, and, uh, yeah, let me mention a couple things we've already done. Uh, we've made we've made for the first time in history all Medicare pricing available in a machine readable format as of January 1st, meaning it can be sucked up into Open API and available in apps for that that commercial developers would develop to make that information available. We have proposed a rule. I think, in fact, the comment period closed this very day to end rebates in the prescription drug market in Part D and require that all of those rebates and discounts be passed through the point of sale to the patient, that would be product by product, um, insurance plan by insurance plan, level transparency of negotiated pricing of pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have teed up a question that is in the recent health IT interoperability rules uh, around the broader disclosure of all negotiated rates across healthcare. So uh, the president also, we had a round table at the, at the White House where the president made it very clear his animosity towards surprise billing and his demand that we find solutions and work with Congress to deliver solutions around surprise billing. Uh, we passed the gag clause, the pharmacy gag clause statutes, at, which now forbid pharmacy benefit managers from preventing pharmacists from delivering transparent information to you as a patient that if you simply paid cash out of pocket for your generic drug, you might get it cheaper than actually running it through your insurance. So, I mean, we're, we're I think we're delivering on the and, and you followed through on the rule that hospitals do have to post charge master prices, yep. which got you both cheers and mm -hmm. some jeers from the price transparency uh, community. And some saying, good first step, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Others saying, not quite far enough. You know, what's one of the things that's been interesting as you talk to people who are in this space, certainly there are motivated shoppers. You were in the story that you told. Um, but there's a, probably only 30 to 40% of consumers who probably fall into that 
active shopper mode. There's been this theory and one that we have been interested to, to look at is in putting some carrots on the table. But when you have price transparency, maybe the way you motivate people, we've had a lot of sticks with deductibles, maybe the way you motivate people is you pay them to go to lower cost options. Do you envision there's ever a future in Medicare and for federal employees, for exchange plans, all things that fall kind of under your purview, or just broadly, if you want to think more theoretically, in which we're starting to pay patients to take advantage of price variation, which research has shown is rampant across the industry? Um, I haven't thought about the issue of, quote, paying patients, but uh, it certainly would be worth looking at. Make, you know, we obviously want to make sure we'd have to be very careful that we're not getting engaged in any type of fraud activity or steering behaviors. That would be, that would be the really probably my outer bound concern to make sure that we weren't in that, so the paying patient aspect of it. But appropriate incentives, I mean, we do that through high deductibles with an HSA. I like funded HSAs better than just high deductibles. Uh, but with a funded HSA, I think you see incredible behavioral change just from that. If, if, as soon as, trust me, as soon as my employer put, they funded our HSA, I was very lucky, they funded our HSA, the minute that money made it into my health savings account, that was my money. You, I mean, you couldn't pry that money out of my hands, okay? Um, it didn't matter where it came from. And I think that's a very normal human behavior. Uh, so that's, that would, I mean, I'm open to thinking about that. Uh, and, and approaching it, but you know, yeah, some state employees, some yeah, of course, state some state employees programs have had some good success or or exploring it. I want to shift gears and talk about one specific initiative that the president mentioned in the State of the Union, and you have spent a decent amount of time talking about the pretty ambitious goal of trying to eliminate HIV and AIDS um, over the next ten years or so. Just walk us through a little bit about your thinking on that and. Give us a sense for what's realistic for the amount of money that it's going to take to, to actually accomplish that sort of goal. So it's completely realistic because we're at a unique moment in history right now. We've got the right data, the right tools, and the right leadership to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. So what do I mean by that? We have the right data. We now have a level of granular detail on where new HIV infections are occurring that we can focus our efforts. We don't have to boil the ocean. We actually know where we need to go and, and what we've got to do. Uh, basically, 50% of new HIV infections are in the United States are occurring in 48 counties, 48 counties, the DC and San Juan, Puerto Rico. They are localized in certain demographic groups. Male sex with male, sex with male individuals, African American community, Latino community, American Indians, Alaska Natives. Okay? It is especially concentrated in the African-American community, male sex with male in the South, rural South. We have seven, seven states with a focused effort. So it doesn't take a ton of money. It takes execution and focus, knowing who you've got to reach. We have the right tools. So for the first time ever, we've got rapid diagnostics. We have got antiretroviral treatments that if you take your antiretroviral treatment and you adhere to it, and you keep your viral load to an undetectable level, you are untransmissible. You will not, we now have the data that NIH believes is well, uh, well supported that if you are undetectable, you are untransmissible. We also now have a product called PrEP. This PrEP you can give to individuals who have at risk behaviors and if they are compliant on that, they have reduced their risks of contracting HIV by 97%, 97%. So what do we have to do? We've got to get people in, get them diagnosed. We've got to get them, if they have HIV, on treatment. If they don't have HIV but have at-risk behaviors, we've got to get them on PrEP. And then we've got to have a rapid response capability so that especially we have 10% of new HIV cases come from injectable drug use. We've got to be able to, when we have clusters erupt, we've got to, like a SWAT team, be able to get in there and contain any outbreak. We have to treat HIV spread every case like a sentinel event eventually, just like we would um, any type of other public health infectious disease outbreak. And then we've got the right leadership. I've got leading the CDC, Dr. Bob Redfield, one of the leading vir virologists and le earliest and leading researchers in HIV AIDS. I've got Tony Fauci leading 
the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, one of the world's great, uh, great HIV AIDS researchers. We've got um, Admiral Jirwa running the, run, as the Assistant Secretary of Health, coordinating all of our efforts. We have SAMHSA, we have the Indian Health Service. You've got me having basically been briefed on this, educated on this, believing this is doable, this is about execution. And I'll tell you what, I told, the, the first time I told the President about this, that we've got the tools to actually end the HIV epidemic in the United States, he, he was immediately and enthusiastically supportive. I did not ask the President to put the HIV initiative in the State of the Union. The President put the, H the ending HIV epidemic in the State of the Union. Um, he's committed to this. I'm committed to this. Um, we'll get that job done. Great. So we talked, transition to uh, some drug pricing questions, another area um, that you all have spent quite a bit of time in. And obviously, given the industry makeup here in Massachusetts, of great interest. So I wanted to ask... The tomatoes uh, are going to start flying. Yeah. <laughs> no, interest, I said, interest. <laughs> so I want to ask a couple of questions along those lines. So, you know, one of the trends we've seen in life science uh, companies is more drugs for rare and orphan diseases. Um, of course, great benefit to those patients, but it's been causing a problem for Medicaid programs in particular. Now, there's some, I believe CMS has allowed at least three states to have value-based contracts, so you pay for drugs spread out over time. To, tied to the effectiveness of the drugs. What role do you think HHS has in speeding up adoption of these kinds of waivers or encouraging states? Or, or is it more of a, we're going to wait for states to come to us and say, you know, what, what are your ideas? What, how do you view that back and forth on Medicaid and drugs in particular? Well, I think we need to first get to proof of concept. So we've got a couple states, I'm aware of two of them, uh, that, that, want to, that are exploring what you might call a Netflix or subscription model to certain products. So take, say, hepatitis C. Uh, a lot of these states have a lot of individuals, especially in the prison system, whose health care they're responsible for, where simply because of the cost and the wave of cases that came with the initial hep C product that came on the market, the price, as well as how many warehouse patients there had been, had to basically ration access to those who were further along the disease continuum towards needing a liver transplant. What if instead you had a model where now that the market's a bit settled and you actually have competitors, if you put out to bid and say, listen, we, it's a requirements contract. We have this many pa as many patients as we have that need this hep C product, that need your hep C product, you will supply and we'll pay you a subscription fee, a per year, per month fee. We can do some adjustments, some reforecasting, true ups, et cetera. Uh, bring predictability into the market. That's one of them is just so in the current marketplace, could they move to a, a subscription type Netflix, it's called model. That's one approach. We have to see if it works. Some states are now working on bidding processes on doing exactly that. Another approach is, uh, is a kind of pay over time, connected to it, but uh, a pay over time type approach. You know, one of the biggest challenges that happened when the initial hep C product came on the market was states budget sometimes a year, two years in advance. And all of a sudden you get a new therapy that you have a large number of patients that need or want, and you can budget bust in one year, and then go down to a more sustainable level, but you've got to absorb, it's like the anaconda, you know, swallowing the, it, you, you've got to absorb that. Could you spread that out? Could you basically accommodate states' needs to have a smooth budget planning horizon? working on that. We are totally open working with states on all of this. Uh, initially, we're not going to force that on them. Initially, we need to see states that are more imaginative, want to try this, be supportive of that, help them through that, get the proof of concept, and then, work, work, then we can work on knowledge dissemination to other states. Okay. So I wanted to ask about, uh, in Great Britain, there's been a famously conducted cost-effectiveness reviews of new therapies. It's called Quality Adjusted Life Years, or QALIs. Stirred some controversy, you may be aware, among British patient groups. And it, the end result often means new oncology or rare disease uh, treatments don't get covered. Now, here in the US, part of the ACA, we effectively banned QALIs for Medicare formularies. But there are some states considering it for their Medicaid program. New York comes to mind in particular. I'm not asking you to weigh on any potential waiver or state programs, but how do you think about the use of these sorts of methodologies when it comes to putting value on certain drugs, particularly on public programs? 
Well, I think it, the last, that last phrase there is, is critical. Um, I, I just, I try to approach everything looking through a lens of patient centricity. Like I said, when you asked me the initial question, patient-centered, personalized care that puts you in control, treats you like a human being and not like a number. Um, how does that work? That works when you have a choice. That works when you can choose different insurance. If the insurance that you have isn't meeting your needs because it's rationing care, rationing access to critical oncology therapies, as long as you have exit rights and can go to a different plan that's making a different values or financial choice, that's a very effective check in the system. So if one big insurance co competitive insurance company in a competitive marketplace uses any methodology it wants to make the decisions about which products it's going to cover, as long as patients have the choice to move to other plans that meet their needs, that's one thing. I have a lot of concern using approaches like that in a single payer system or in a or in a part of our market that effectively operates like a single payer. So for me, that's a part of our program that I run. It's called Medicare Fee for Service. So in Medicare, you can be in the traditional 1960s fee for service program, or you can opt into what's called the Medicare Advantage program, which is a program of insurance with competitive offerings offered by private insurance companies. Um, you know, we're seeing Medicare Advantage get bigger I think over half of new enrollees are moving into the private sector Medicare Advantage plans, but still Medicare, the traditional Medicare fee for services, I believe over 65% of our population is still in that. Um, so I do, I do view myself as having a special responsibility in terms of access and accountability to those individuals that are working within essentially a government run insurance system. Um, so to, to say, that if something doesn't meet a quality threshold that a bunch of academics, no offense to the academics in the room, sit and say is a value-based number, and if not, good luck, you don't get it, go to France, I've got real concern about that. I've got real concern about that because I simply don't, I don't buy into the proposition that there is an objectively identifiable notion of value that a bunch of health economists in a room can discern outside of market forces with appropriate market actors with exit rights in a competitive system. Informed by whatever information they want, qualities, health economics reviews, whatever. But I just, I don't buy into the notion that there's some just abstract notion of what something is worth outside of market dynamics. You may have offended a, Q, a couple uh, economists right now. <laughs> Interesting. So let, let's talk shift to, to Medicare, and I wanted to spend a couple minutes on reforming Medicare in general, and then I want to switch to Medicare, the whole debate about Medicare for all, if you will. So there have been, for decades, people have pointed to Medicare reforms as leading to unintended consequences in the commercial market, because often people follow Medicare. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how do you how do you think about government being the first mover on reform versus putting your thumb on the scale and saying this is the way you will move? And let me give you just one concrete example if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Accountable care organizations. Now there's, I think, a still debate to be had about how effective accountable care organizations are or have been or are some more successful than others. I want to put that aside. But one thing I think that's not debatable is that accountable care organizations have led to greater consolidation which has been very concerning to people on both the right and the left for a variety of reasons. One of them being the disappearance of independent providers or making it much more difficult. So two questions here. One, what's the future for independent providers in this age of consolidation? And two, how do you reform a program like Medicare? How do you think about reforming a program like that without the unintended ripple effects that often have been at least people have claimed to be there? So there's a lot in there. Yep. Let me, let me unpack first the consolidation question and then hit the, the sort of us as a driver of innovation slash uh, influencer across the broader system. So as a driver of consolidation, uh, my view is that the marketplace should consolidate if the economics warrant the market being consolidated. 
but we should not, by our regulation, be driving marketplace consolidation or disaggregation. We ought to be agnostic to ownership structures as much as we can. Uh, the challenge is there's several forces that do drive towards that, towards consolidation. One of them is a regulatory issue. Uh, and that is various fraud provisions that are completely well-meaning that we have, like the anti-kickback statute, that say if you pay any remuneration in return for the referral of a federally funded service, you have committed an offense against the United States. So people tend to treat that quite cautiously. Um, interestingly, though, if you're co-owned, there's no such thing. So. I have found it odd that at a time when no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, you would say, we need better integration and coordination and holistic approaches to care delivery and pay to pay, not based on procedures and disaggregated procedures and sickness, but rather for outcomes, that we have a regulatory approach that says, if you work together, if you gain share, if you collaborate, and do so outside of a common ownership structure, you better hire some real good lawyers to make sure you're doing it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because you've created a massive incentive to common ownership just from that. Then of course we have one of the issues I just briefly mentioned earlier, which is site neutrality. Well that's not been the doctrine so far and for providers, hospital providers in the room, um, you know, there'll be some upset about this, but we fundamentally believe that where you get your care delivered should not drive the reimbursement rate because that distorts the system. I find it absurd that if you go to a doctor's office and get an echocardio stress test, it's $550, but if that doctor's office happens to be on a hospital campus and that doctor happens to be owned by the hospital, it's $5,500. Well, Medicare, we're moving the entire Medicare system towards site neutrality. We pay the same amount wherever the service is delivered. And that, that's a core doctrine of our approach to healthcare. Again, you know, you shouldn't be acquiring medical practices so that you can charge hospital-based rates to Medicare, okay? That's a critical part, actually, of our budget proposal this year. Um, so that's on the, this aggregation point. I, um, ACOs, if they drive aggregation, I don't think the money, in, I don't think there's been enough money in ACOs for them, frankly, to be the cause for a lot of the aggregation that we've seen in the system. Um, but the we're looking at reforms around these various fraud provisions to get us out, to protect against fraud, but still enable collaboration outside of ownership structures. So that, that, that'll be the hopefully the solution there. Uh, then you asked about Medicare sort of driving the system. Yep. You know, listen, we, we dominate the system. Medicare fee-for-service dominates healthcare in the United States. If you, if you want to know why, we pay for and practice medicine in the United States in many respects the way we did in the 1960s. It's because we're using payments or the, the 60s plus a major iteration in the 80s with, pay, with the PPS regimes, the prospective payment system regimes. It's because Medicare really does dominate how we deliver health care in the United States. Um, we, uh, you may have really big payers out there, but they are either locally concentrated or they can be a, an inch deep and a mile wide, Medicare dominates in any marketplace where we exist. A lot of your payer contracts with hospitals and major providers are simply written, it's like one page. We will pay you 128% of Medicare fee for service. So whatever Azar decides at his conference table in the Humphrey building is the base for the commercial reimbursements. And um, so what we do does matter. Sure. Uh, in a great way. And that's why it's so important that we are trying to change fee for service, try to innovate, move away from paying for procedures and sickness to move to paying for outcomes and value using our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Authorities. I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, to drive change because it'll, it'll have a just tremendous ripple effect throughout the system. And I guess I'm not ashamed of using that even as a free market individual because what did Colin Powell say? If you broke it, you have to fix it. You, know, you own it or you have to fix it. Well, I mean, if we're driving distortions in the system, don't we have an obligation to use the same powers and tools to try to fix the system? So let's talk a little bit about this Medicare for all single payer discussion that we're seeing and will dominate the headlines. I think 675 people running for the Democratic nomination, most of them have endorsed 
some proposal. We've got a congressional proposal or two on the table. At the state level, you're seeing some conversations about Medicaid buy-in. Talk to us about what reforms need to happen to make that conversation not relevant, and how quickly do they need to happen? Okay, so first, obviously, I'm not going to comment at all sure. about the pol about politics. My, my, my comments are purely on the policy merits of health, health systems. Um, it's an interesting way of phrasing it. What needs to have one stop, like have that not be needed? I just, I find it, I mean, it is interesting that um, it seems that there's now some fairly bipartisan consensus that the Affordable Care Act isn't working. Um, you know, we've obviously been, we, you know, the president and I and others have been there for quite some time in saying that the ACA is not delivering on its promise of delivering affordable care to individuals and leaving 29 million Americans behind in, in, in uninsurance. But it now seems like some of the same folks who brought us the Affordable Care Act are saying it didn't work and you need this whole complete government takeover of health care as the response to that. Um, I'm not sure I buy that, <laughs> that notion that you tried this very government-centric, Washington will tell you, approach that failed. So the answer is to just double down and really have Washington and the government tell you how to run health care and what your insurance should be and everything else. I'm um, not buying it, not buying it. Um, but I do believe that those of us who believe in markets, as I said at the outset, um, that we have an obligation to articulate a different, a different approach. Um, we have been driving a different approach. Um, and we need to do a better job probably communicating that and putting, pulling that all together, but driving towards transparency, driving towards putting the patient at the center, driving towards consumer-driven where people have skin in the game and actually make choices, but do so in a, in a market where they can actually function as marketplace actors, which you can't do if you don't have price and quality transparent information. You cannot be an actor in that. But also recognizing the fact, and this is, pro this is something that has hit me as a consumer of health care. I mean, I guess it's good when you're Secretary of Health and Human Services that you get sick, you interact with doctors, and you have to spend some time in a hospital. Um, it's complex. It's hard. It's difficult. Um, and I, I think probably those of us who believe in consumer-directed care, believe in marketplace incentives, um, need to add something to that, which is a helping hand. The notion that people interacting with the health care system want to be cared for. They want ease. They want someone to help them navigate through that world, especially those who have comorbidities, high acuities. Our vision of healthcare would be that you're not alone in the healthcare system, that you'll have someone, some entity with aligned incentives there to assist you, not a gatekeeper, not a rationer, but someone to hold your hand through that, especially if you've got higher needs. And that's what we're going to be trying to drive towards. Um, you'll see that uh, progressively as we work on demonstration projects through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, but I think that's a very different vision of healthcare. The notion that you're working in a marketplace, you can be a consumer, you can choose, you have skin in the game, the government has a role to support and help those who are in need. Um, but we get incentives aligned towards driving towards better quality, lower price, but you're not alone. You're not feeling just you've been pushed into a so-called marketplace. Sure. So I wanted to, before we transition to a couple questions um, from the audience that were submitted, I wanted to ask about Medicaid, which we call Mass Health here in the state. We have about one in four residents on the program. It's over 40% of our state budget, and Governor Baker and his team have pushed very hard, uh, especially down the ACO road, to try to get to a more sustainable program. I want to ask at a higher level, though, so this is a program that historically was for low-income, disabled individuals. It's now the backbone of our long-term care system pay, as a payer. It's been open to a lot of able-bodied adults, which historically haven't been on the program, under the ACA. And there's been a lot of conversations about opening it up to funding things like social determinants of house, like housing. How do you think about reforming that program long-term with all of those drivers that are going kind of the opposite direction, if you will, on spending in this program? I think it's important to recognize a couple hard truths of what the Affordable Care Act did with Medicaid. It took a program that historically was very focused on the aged, the disabled, um, children, pregnant women, 
and actually created a massive financial incentive for states to instead prefer able-bodied adults over them to a 90% match rate compared to the average 60-ish percent match rate. So if you're running a program at the state level, you actually, are, if you have a dollar to spend, it's a vastly more efficient transaction to spend it on able-bodied adults than on the disabled, aged, pregnant women, children in your program. I think that's a terrible distortion um, and harms the core of traditional Medicaid. And so our vision of Medicaid is to actually, the other, well, the other big problem is it's basically an, a, a limitless pot because there's no cap, there's no restriction. Um, if you insure them, we will pay. It's like, you know, that kind of just the more beneficiaries who meet the criteria, the federal government just writes the check and it just keeps going and going at 90% at match rate. Um, so the vision that we've got of Medicaid is one of really ensuring that the, get, put the states more in the driver's seat, give them money, let them make the choices, and let them focus those resources where they believe the highest needs are, not where the national government says that the highest need is able-bodied adults who make between 100 and 138 percent of federal poverty level, um, or whatever, or even zero, zero to 138 percent sorry, of federal poverty level for able-bodied adults. Let them actually figure out what their needs are and where that money ought to go and remove those distortions in the system and put it on a fiscally sustainable long-term path that doesn't, that isn't just an, a completely uncapped um, entitlement program that will eventually not just hurt states but hurt, hurt the national government. Great. So let's um, transition to a couple questions that were um, submitted here, some very thoughtful ones, some long ones, but I will try to my best here to it's recap. Think tank. Yes, I know. I wouldn't without, without expect anything questions. else. <laughs> so I'm going to try to summarize a couple of these, some of similar ones. The essence of this question is, we have a history of health care reforms that have led to the outcomes where we have now. More health care, spending on health care as a percentage of our GDP. Why will future reforms have a different outcome than these past reforms? Well, it depends what the reforms are. Um... The Affordable Care Act reforms would not have been the reforms that I would have chosen to do. And, you know, an uncapped Medicaid program, as we just talked about, an uncapped individual subsidy that, I mean, imagine you design a system where the premium that the government pays through subsidy goes up to basically whatever insurance companies set as the premium. I mean, it's starting to sound like the, the drug market, drug pricing market. Um, so I, it depends what the reforms are. Look what we did with Medicare Advantage, you know, we, and actually, and with the Part D drug program. We, we did reform, we brought a drug benefit to senior citizens, but we did it using competitive marketplace vehicles. We have very powerful market actors, drug companies and PBMs who negotiate against each other. They get discounts, now I want those discounts passed to patients, but they get discounts that are a level comparable to OECD levels of discounts, even with single payer systems. And they do it in a competitive marketplace with exit rights, with extremely high patient satisfaction. And it's still sitting under budget from what was originally forecast for the program. MA, we've introduced, we've introduced these, these Medicare Advantage private sector-based plans that people find incredibly popular. I said the majority of the, of the new aging in beneficiaries are choosing into those plans because they like the competition, they like the holistic benefit package of drug and medical together that they're used to from their private employer experience. We keep adding supplement, the opportunity for supplemental benefits. I think we need to grant even more freedom to innovate to the Medicare Advantage plans. We keep thinking of um, Medicare fee for service, what we've talked about before is needing to be the innovator, but perhaps the innovation ought to come even more from Medicare Advantage. These private plans, they actually know how to run insurance. It's like the job. And Maybe we should let them have more freedom to innovate, create new mechanisms for payment, benefit packages, and everything. And Medicare fee for service becomes sometimes a fast follower of MA rather than thinking the whole world has to sit around and wait for fee for service for us to come up with ideas. So I think 
you know, it all depends who's doing the reforming sure. and what the reforms are. Sure. And you did a nice job earlier kind of describing where people are getting their insurance may drive that conversation. It's a question about how do you see the future of gene editing? A promising field, but obviously with a lot of bioethical challenges. Yep. So gene editing holds out an incredible, incredible promise. I mean, I was just this morning at, or this afternoon at Boston Children's Hospital um, with, uh, with Governor Baker. And I got to meet a young man who I believe has had his sickle cell anemia cured okay, through gene therapies. Um, we have at NIH, if you saw a 60 Minutes episode a couple weeks ago, a counterpart program that we're doing research on that holds the potential to, through gene editing, completely cure sickle cell anemia. We have CAR T therapies now that basically convert T cells into these basically super killers against cancer targeted through um, vi you know, viral vectors and gene editing. We've got CRISPR technology. Um, so incredible personalized promise for curing the most devastating diseases. I would encourage you to just look at Francis Collins' interview in that 60 Minutes show to just hear from an actual scientist the potential. That being said, it also opens up any number of unbelievable ethical quandaries. We saw the recent incident in China that I think has all of us completely aghast. Um, so we need to ensure that our ethical frameworks are adapted to the promise as well as the potential harm of something as powerful as the ability to manipulate the human gene and reprogram one's body. So this is an issue that's obviously gotten a lot of attention here locally. Somebody asked, how do you diagnose the opioid crisis? Is this a case of irresponsible marketing by companies? Is this a case of illegal smuggling? Is it a case of too many prescription drugs on the market due to public programs? And I'll throw in one other one that I got asked out, outside is, should states be able to regulate methadone in their Medicaid programs? How do you diagnose this problem? Where do you, how does that inform where you go next? So on a lot of those, the answer is yes. Um, the, there's no, we didn't get into the opioid crisis overnight. It wasn't just one factor. And there needs to be accountability. Uh, if you know, any illegal or improper marketing practices, absolutely, the United States is, a, is, is injected itself into litigation related to that. Um, the broad scale, excessive overuse of legal opioids clearly is at the foundation of this. Um, the cheap manufacture of black tar heroin followed by now fentanyl and the just shockingly cheap and accessible um, in high quantities of fentanyl, uh, the manufacture, the means of production as well as the ability to, to sneak that into the country. Uh, yes, part of that. Uh, the incentives in the system, you know, pain as, as the fifth vital sign. When we change a system that says to hospitals and physicians that you're going to be reimbursed based on whether a patient feels any pain, you know what you get? You get less pain. What's the tool that we had for less pain? We had opioids as the tool for less pain. So we got a lot of opioid use on top of per perhaps illegal or improper marketing tactics, on top of innovative opioids that then were genericized and became cheap and remarkably easy to prescribe. It's a heck of a lot easier for a doctor at discharge to write you a script for a 90-day generic legal opioid than it is to write a script for uh, physical therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, go through whatever else it is and deal with the PA processes and accessibility of all of those non-pharmacological interventions that could happen. So what happens? You get a script for 90 days of generic opioids when you get wisdom teeth out or whatever, you know, whatever, or your hip replacement or a knee injury or whatever else it is. Um, so yes, I mean, it's a very huge multi-factor problem that brought us to this point. That's why we're not gonna get out of it overnight, but the good news is every single leading indicator is, in, is headed in the right direction. Uh, through the president and bipartisan leadership, we've, we've really got a national commitment to tackle this. Our use of legal opioids is down, so on a, on a, morph, on a um, uh, morphine, milligram equivalent basis down by 28% from January of 2017. Um, our prescribing of legal opioids prescriptions are down over 20% since January of 17. 
Um, we need to have medication-assisted treatment, and that is soaring. We've got the use of buprenorphine and naltrexone, all of those which are MATs to help wean people off of their opioids and get them into recovery. Those are soaring. Uh, we have to help people who overdose so that they don't die from the overdose. Uh, naloxone prescriptions are up over 500% since January of 2017. Our morbidity uh, from opioids is now flattening and you know, hopefully we'll take a bend to, into negative territory. So everything's aiming in the right direction on the opioid crisis, but it, 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 we have a long, long way to go. Let me ask you one final question here. You, you're probably not thinking about legacy at this point, but what are you most hopeful of the things that you're working on will carry over into future administrations, and what initiatives are you most worried might get lost? Well, what I would like to ensure during my tenure and the president's tenure is that we we set the foundations that you can't go back on that will completely change how health care is delivered and paid for in the United States in the decades remaining and hopefully <laughs> my lifetime. Um, you know, you make pricing and quality transparent. You don't go back on that. You pull through discounts so patients see them at the point of sale and you get rid of this whole list price to discount dynamic. That doesn't come back. Once you make, you know, once that happens, you you fundamentally have altered that. You've introduced real point of sale competition on on pricing mechanisms. Um, you create personal, personally owned, interoperable health IT. You don't go back on that. People then move. You see a you see just a boom in IT like you saw in, in the 90s in IT, but this time around healthcare and with solutions for individuals. So. You know, do you see the end fruits of that during your tenure? No, but you lay the foundation in ways that can't, you can't go back on. These are it's what everyone knows we need, but it takes, frankly, it takes somebody like President Trump who's willing to, willing to actually, we got a lot of vested special interests in healthcare, and every single thing we do disrupts one of them. Just look at the TV ads they run against me. Um, every darn thing I do, who cares? Um, and he doesn't care. That's the great, yeah, you know, I got a boss who's got my back on this. He says, he says get drug prices down. Get healthcare more affordable. Get more insurance options to people. Get insurance to be cheaper. Get deductibles down for people. Get cost sharing down for people so that they have better access. Protect Medicare. Protect people with private with private employer insurance. So just get it done. And he's got my back on it. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, I know your schedule is you have to run. So please join me in thanking uh, Secretary Azar for Thank joining you. us. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We're going to invite Colby Hewitt to come on up and close the evening for us. So, Colby, if you would come up, please. <coughs> Thank you all for joining us this evening, and sincere thanks to Secretary Azar. It was an exciting opportunity to hear him speak, uh, particularly touching the uh, uh, the commentary on the, on the AIDS epidemic and work that's being done to end that over the next decade. I'd also like to thank the team at Pioneer that makes this event a success every year. Thirteen years ago, donations made to Pioneer Institute and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, two organizations chaired by my grandfather, Colby Hewitt, Jr., were used to establish a health care lecture in his honor reflecting his commitment to improving health care and his belief that all things are possible through educated and unapologetic conversation. Over the life of this event, Pioneer's healthcare practice has grown into a powerful presence in Massachusetts and nationally. This lecture, too, has grown over the last 13 years into an important stage for open discussion and respectful debate. What a concept. Not always the easiest task, given the substantial change in the industry and disparity in politics. Pioneer Institute's mission is to improve the quality of life and to expand prosperity in Massachusetts through civic discourse and data-driven public policy solutions. They're supported in this work 
by generous individuals and foundations that have seen Pioneer remain relevant and fulfill this charge over these many years. Our family believes deeply in Pioneer's mission and its ability to execute. I'm also proud to work for a company that's a corporate member of Pioneer. If you're a donor, thank you. If not, I'd like to invite you to learn more. Members of the organization would be happy to speak with you outside the theater to share more information on the good work they do every day. And if the secretary's cleared the room, I, I just want to add Pete Peters at this point would have said, uh, if what you've heard tonight inspires a generous impulse toward Pioneer, please don't hesitate to act upon it. Again, thank you very much for coming and good night. <laughs>